Dobry wieczór. Będziemy zaczynać. Po polsku powiem tylko jedno zdanie. Przypomnę, że proszę, żeby wyłączyć telefony i inne głośno mówiące urządzenia. A resztę może powiem po angielsku. So our guest today is Professor Fernando Quevedo. He is a very distinguished scientist. He is a professor at Cambridge University and also a director at the International Center for Theoretical Physics interest in Italy. This is like big international organization for theoretical physics. He's also uh, a scientist who does work in uh, string theory and particle physics in phenomenology related to those topics. And the title of the lecture today is The Search for the Fundamental Theory of the Universe. Thank, thank you very much. Yes. It's okay, the sound? Okay, well, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and to be in Warsaw. This is a, my third time visiting here. I always enjoy coming. We are having a conference. That's the reason we're, I'm here. I'm, uh, I'm enjoying every single minute of this. And uh, thank you all for coming. <coughs> so uh, the title is, uh, is the first time I give a talk with this title. For me, it's interesting because uh, 20, more than 20 years ago, I wrote a book in Spanish with that title, which I never published. So, so this is the first time I use it with the original thing I had in my mind 20 years ago. And uh, essentially, it's important. We're searching for something we call the fundamental theory of the universe. And uh, I will try to give you an idea how is it that people have been making progress in this direction over the years. <coughs> so. We as scientists, we always dream to have a, a scientific revolution. So, and uh, we think that probably we are close to poten a potential new revolution in science. And I don't know about the timing, but the place looks like the right one. <laughs> because I think uh, Copernicus was the person that uh, had uh, uh, created, I mean, it came up with, the, with, with the, the, what we call the scientific revolution by realizing that we are not at the center of the universe. And I think well, he's a, one of your locals, which is very good. So, so some indication for this is uh, I would like to emphasize, and we'll spend some time on this slide, which uh, in the last 25 years, I can uh, pick the biggest uh, discoveries that we have experienced in the last 25 years. And I came out with four. So if you can come out of this talk with something, I hope that it is this list of four uh, discoveries that change our way, the way we understand the universe. The first one is uh, what is called the fluctuations of the cosmic microwave background, discovered in 1992 and the Nobel Prize in 2006. The idea here is that there is a, a radiation that has, was created almost at the beginning of the universe that is supposed to be uh, identical in all directions. They were discovered in the 1960s. That's what is called the cosmic microwave background. That's the best evidence we have for the Big Bang. And uh, up to 1992, it looked identical in all directions. But uh, in 1992, the COVID satellite, they, they managed to be so precise that uh, one, one part in 10, in, in 100,000. Uh, and they realized that there are small ch uh, changes when you look at different uh, points in, this, in, in the space, and those are the different colors I'm showing here. So the, the red is a bit hotter than the blue and the green in between and so on, and the yellow. So that's, those small changes in temperature that you see from this radiation, is very, they are very important because it just shows that the very early universe, at the very beginning of the universe, there were these fluctuations of, of, of temperature. And uh, that was observed, so the first time was observed in 1982. They fit very, very, very well with the distribution we see of galaxies and the large-scale structure of the universe. So if something is crucial for understanding our origins, it is this discovery, because they say that the origins of all the galaxies that we see now, or galaxies including the stars and ourselves, it came out from small fluctuations at the very early universe that people have been able to compute. And they computed using something uh, a scenario is called the inflationary scenario. It's just, this is the picture of the very 
rough version of what the Big Bang is. It's just Big Bang here that we don't know what happened. And the period right after that, there is a, a, most people believe there is a special uh, period where the universe expanded very, very fast, you know, exponentially fast. And that's called inflation. After that, this took a, a small fraction of, of seconds. And after that, it continued expanding in the standard way that uh, people have discovered in the 1920s, uh, that when people realized that the universe is actually expanding. Expanding means that the galaxies are separating from each other. And, uh, <clears throat> and using this idea of inflation, people can compute what this density the perturbations are, that the changes in temperature, and they fit very well with the experiment. So that's, essentially that shows you that this, and, 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 and this uh, fluctuations which are microscopic, when they expand with the universe, they give rise to the, a lot of the structure that we see in the universe, which are galaxies and, and clusters and so on. So this is a very important discovery. And uh, over the years, in the last uh, 25 years or so, there has been uh, improved, the, the precision has been improved, and that has made cosmology since the, those days to now. It is very scientific um, uh, field in the sense that people now can do calculations and compare with experiments which with high precision, something that we used to do. We're used to doing physics in the Earth, but in cosmology, usually it's very difficult to, to, to come up with concrete results, and this, is, uh, this has been essentially the beginning of that new period for for cosmology now, that pe people see that whatever you, s you observe in cosmology, you can cal do calculations and compare the calculations with your theory. The second discovery was a, a real surprise to all of us in 1998. And it says that the universe now is not only expanding, but it's expanding in an accelerated way. So it's fa expanding faster and faster. And that is surprising. Why? Because we know that the dominant interaction at large distances is gravity, and gravity is always attractive. So when we were thinking that the universe was expanding, we thought that it was going to be slow, slower and slower and slower because all the, thing, all the galaxies would be attracting themselves, trying to, to fight against the expansion. However, it was discovered that it's actually expanding faster and faster and faster. So there is something there that is beating gravity to, 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 <clears throat> to act against gravity and instead of being attractive, it would be it's repulsive, and that makes the galaxies to expand faster and faster. And the, that's something we don't know what it is. Since we don't know what it is, we invented a nice name, and the name is dark energy. So, and that has been a mystery. The evidence is compelling, and the Nobel Prize was given in 2011. The third discovery, it was uh, less surprising. We were all expecting it, but it close a chapter in the history of, uh, of science because it was the last particle that needed to be discovered in what we call now the standard model. And that particle is called Higgs. It was discovered five years ago, yesterday. And I, was, uh, I had the, the privilege to be sitting in the room when they announced it. It's one of the most exciting moments of your career when you see this uh, hundreds of scientists celebrating the discovery of a new particle that has been, people were searching it for more than 40 years. And the Nobel Prize was given immediately after, the year after. The third, the fourth one is a, a, what we call gravitational waves. So we, we, are, we know what waves are from the sea and something with electromagnetic waves and so on. But uh, gravitational waves, gravity being so weak, uh, they were predicted in 2000 and, and sorry, in 1916 by Einstein when he came up with his theory of gravity. He predicted gravitational waves and it took 100 years for scientists, engineers, and, uh, to come up with an idea, to, a way to detect them. And the event was a very dramatic event. And two black holes colliding with each other 1.2 billion years ago, and merging into a bigger object, in a bigger black hole. And that was observed in 2016. Or after, since then, several other events have been observed. And uh, the Nobel Prize was given in uh, October last year. So this is the most recent discovery. And uh, it has opened a new way to see at the universe. So it's a, a way to, to imagine, it. imagine you go to a concert and see musicians playing, but we are not listening. You only see the motion, you don't know what they, are, what they are doing. But you open your ears also, and then you see that they're playing music. That's what the way that we are seeing now the universe uh, see from through the gravitational waves. We were only seeing through electromagnetic waves, through light, and now we can see, quote unquote, the universe through gravitational waves. So it's a new way to see the universe. And uh, so we expect a lot of new discoveries coming out of, of this new development. 
This is uh, an ex example that I would like to emphasize because it will come out l later. Uh, it's an example of how science works. So Einstein predicted gravitational waves 1916, 100 years before. He had no idea how it was going to be discovered. So he didn't have no proposal. He said, well, just out of my theory, these waves have to be there, so you have, they have to exist. It took a year later, Einstein himself was thinking of completely different things. He was thinking on the, uh, in atomic physics, and uh, a, a <clears throat> the, there is a, a phenomenon called a stimulated emission of atoms, where the light is emitted in a particular way. And that phenomenon was explained by uh, Einstein. Einstein discovered it, he explained it. And that was used to stimulate the mission 40 years later, when Einstein had already died, to invent the lasers. So now the lasers that we are all seeing here, and you can see what I'm pointing, it, was, it came out from that idea of Einstein 40 years before it was invented. And it happens to be that using lasers, that gravitational waves were detected 100 years after Einstein predicted. So the two ideas came at the same time for Einstein, completely different things, completely un uncorrelated at that time. And the, he couldn't imagine that the idea that he came out a year after was used precisely to detect the gravitational waves that he had predicted. So this is a beautiful example of how theory and experiment work together. And we, doing theory, don't know, don't know how our ideas will be tested in the future. And maybe some of the things that are being developed right now can be used to detect our predictions. So please remember these four things. I think this is the, the major part of my, of my talk. And uh, uh, during the next 50 slides or so, I will try to, to come up with a, a filling up all the gaps and try to tell you how people have been doing through history uh, work to, to end up with the discoveries and what kind of the problems are still open. So why are the discoveries important? So we have to go slowly. So let me just tell you some historical facts about uh, the science history. Uh, I recommend a book that came out uh, last year or so by Steven Weinberg called To Explain the World. It's a beautiful book. But it's just following the history of physics up to the last century. And, uh, and I will follow more or less the same spirit. Uh, the title is very interesting. It's, it's Explain the World. So that's what science is about. And uh, what I try to follow is just how we, are gaining, we have been gaining understanding of nature from a concept which is called unification. So how the, with several phenomena that looks different, at some point we find a simple idea that can explain more. So the, the, the explanation that has the simplest uh, assumptions to co explain many, many phenomena is, 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 is usually the best one, and that has not, we have been uncovering the secrets of nature for the last few centuries. So the goals and techniques of science, we have to explain the physical phenomena, that's a goal. For that, we have to ask well-defined questions that we can address and be able to answer with the techniques we have. And crucial for science that we, have to, we can make predictions and test those predictions by experiments. Notice that the four big discoveries I mentioned in the previous slides, they were all experimental discoveries, not theoretical. Because it's difficult to come up with achievements of the theory, because uh, the theory you, you only know later, much later when the experiments are, are confirming the theory, if the theory is correct or not. <clears throat> but it's crucial for a theory to identify predictions that you can make and eventually uh, be able to test it. And the tools we have, we have our senses, that's how uh, the evolution of, uh, of uh, our species. People use our, the senses to try to explain the different phenomena. Uh, but then our brain, and in our brain, first thing is curiosity, how to understand the things with phenomena we see, we want to understand, and that's what makes us humans, that we are curious, naturally curious to understand what we see in the world. Then we have to use, invent or uh, the technology that can allow us to detect things beyond our senses. For instance, when I told you that people discovered the cosmomicrobial background, it's not about using our eyes that they were discovered, but just using these big antennas and so on, and satellites and so on. So we have to go beyond our senses to the, the, have the technology that allows us to detect things that we cannot see with, the, uh, with eyes, for instance. And crucial for that is analytic thinking, using logical uh, uh, arguments, 
to eliminate things that make sense, that don't make sense, and only concentrate on things that make sense. And for that, mathematics is the key uh, tool that we have, because you have to, consistency of mathematics itself has to be important in everything we do to, to describe the physical phenomenon. So those are the tools we have. So, okay, so following with the theme of unification, the first concrete example that I can mention is the as a Newton's unification of gravity. He always claimed that he, well, he managed to achieve a lot in science because he, he was uh, standing on the shoulders of science, of uh, giants. And these are the giants, Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler, for instance. But he himself probably is the, the greatest scientist that ever existed. And uh, what is it that the things that, that the main thing that we can uh, assign to Newton is that he had gravity on Earth you know, the standard falling apple, and the motion of planets, and he realized that they were the same phenomena. This is unification at work. So whatever you drop here is a, is the, is called, is a, is a force called gravity, and it's the same force that keeps the planets going around the sun and eventually uh, <clears throat> the satellites around the Earth and so on. So essentially, gravity on Earth and gravity on space are the same phenomena, so it's a, it's a unification. And for that, don't, scare about the, don't be scared about the equations. I will write a few equations just to let you know that uh, that's the mathematics is the real tool that we use, and it's important to quantify things. And this is the famous equation for Newton, the, the force between two particles, and it's inversely in proportional to the distance, up to the co uh, multiplied by a constant that's called the <coughs> gravitational constant, or, and that has a big measure, and this it has a particular value. This is one of the constants of nature. And so, so that's the force between two bodies, so, so the Earth and the Moon. <clears throat> and it's important for me to show you the questions because usually these talks tend to be many pictures and, and, uh, and figures or so, and some people who are not scientists may have the wrong impression that science is about that. But if we are more quantitative, we do calculations, and that's an important part of our, our work. The second example in the 19th century is the unification of electricity and magnetism by two of the greatest scientists ever. Uh, Faraday probably is the greatest experimental physicist ever, who didn't, didn't have a, a education himself. He just was self-taught, and uh, he made, managed to make a great, great discoveries in science, and Maxwell. And they unified the two concepts, electricity and magnetism, that were thought to be completely independent before then. So essentially, the electricity of charges attracting or repelling themselves, a force similar to the gravity, but now depending on the charges, with a constant here, depending on, 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 on the interaction of the, 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 the force. And magnetism, which as we know about the uh, magnets. And these two things are the same phenomenon, electricity and magnetism, so it's called electromagnetism. And that's governed by these equations, which are called the Maxwell equations. An important thing about this Maxwell equation, there is a constant here also, it's called C, and C happens to be the speed of light. And by what they say is that what happens is that a changing electric field produces a magnetic field, and a changing magnetic field produces an electric field. So you have uh, the two together, they can be changing, uh, one electric field changing can produce a magnetic field, and the other one will be producing an electric field, and so on. And that will be keeping it forever. And that's precisely, and, and it's a wave, and that wave is moving with a speed, and the speed happens to be the speed of light. So then, from Maxwell's equation, you will discover that that's precisely what light is. So a, a whole other field called optics at that time, studying the properties of light, happened to be immediately absorbed and unified with the ideas of uh, Maxwell of electromagnetism. So it's another unification. Not only did it unify electricity and magnetism, but also included optics into that uh, uh, formalism. And now we know what optics is. It's just electromagnetic waves moving. And uh, so that was, uh, you know, again, unification at work. Another one is uh, thermodynamics, you know, th uh, the physics about uh, temperatures and uh, pressure and so on, uh, which is a microscopic uh, sub uh, uh, physical microscopic subject. It is intimately related with the mechanics of, new of Newton, of the particles moving and the subject through the Newton's force and so on. And throughout the centuries, from the 18th to the 19th century, people like Bernoulli, Clausius, Maxwell, Boltzmann, and Gibbs, they managed to describe the thermodynamics in terms of the motion of the particles that compose the particular 
object. For instance, you have uh, some particles in some uh, place. You, uh, you heat that with us. So you put some fire there to heat it, and then the particles are moving faster and faster. And that motion of being faster, you measure with a thermometer, and this, the temperature is raising. Essentially, what is temperature? Temperature is just an average of the, of the energy, the kinetic energy of the particles. So again, it unifies two different concepts, temperature and velocities. Velocities of particles, microscopic and microscopic. Okay. <clears throat> the similar idea is uh, Boltzmann. Boltzmann uh, studied uh, many things, but in particular, he was obsessed with a uh, quantity called entropy, which is a measure of how um, disordered the system is. It is the basis of what we call the second law of thermodynamics, that everything gets messier and messier with that time, which is unfortunate. Uh, and uh, he identified this, uh, this concept of, of entropy, which is microscopic again, with something mi uh, microscopic. With, uh, just as, and he has this expression that he has to be in, in, in his uh, tombstone, and it's the, uh, the, the entropy is a constant called Boltzmann constant, another constant of nature, say, times the log of W, where W is a measure of the number of states that you have possible. So you have particles in, 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 a, in a recipient, so you can, how many options you have, how the distribution of the particles in the place. So again, it's the microscopic gives rise to the microscopic. So following the idea of unification, then comes the 20th century, and then Einstein, and uh, he unified another concept, space and time. So we know we can describe every single phenomenon that we see in nature as something located in one place and passing through time. And Einstein realized by studying, in particular, the Maxwell's equation of electromagnetism, but also to, uh, seeing how <clears throat> uh, to describe the phenomena independent of, of the location of the observer, uh, he came up with the theory of, of uh, special relativity special relativity, and essentially you can see, uh, it's a s simple way to see that you have, uh, here's a, a, an observer, with, and then everything that is inside this cone moves with a speed smaller than the speed of light, and everything outside moves with a speed higher than the speed of light. So Einstein's theory implies that the speed of light is the maximum, so you can only send information to anything within this cone. And, uh, so, and this is space and time mixed together. And again, this is another constant of nature, which is the speed of light. And another unification is space and time. Same Einstein, 1915, he unifies the space, time, and geometry, and a physical object, which is a space and time, with the geometry, which is a mathematical subject. He claims to be the happiest thought of his life, and you can see he enjoying it. And, uh, Essentially, he understood that uh, gravity is not only is not more than just the curvature of space and time. So you can think about sp uh, spaces which are flat, like uh, this, uh, uh, well, like the wall here, for instance. But uh, the space-time being curved, like uh, you, know, you can imagine a sphere or something like this you know, for a space, but doing the, now the whole space-time, like you say. So essentially, the attraction of, <coughs> of that the Earth does to the Moon is because the Earth, by having mass, curved the space-time around, and then that forces the Moon to move around. And that's this, everything that has to do with gravity, gravitational interactions, is just explained in terms of the geometry, geometry of the curve of space and time. So that's, a, again, another unification of uh, two different uh, fields, which has space-time where the physics happens, to geometry where the mathematicians have been only working on. So this is... a. Not only is the happiest thought of his life, but probably for many of us physicists, this may be the most beautiful theory ever uh, discovered or invented. In this. So that's for all of us, every time we see, when we learn uh, general theory of relativity, is one of the greatest pleasures you can imagine. And uh, so, and I think we all thank to Einstein for giving us that pleasure. <clears throat> Another unification. It's again in the 20th century, it's probably the biggest revolution in the many, many years in physics, and that's quantum mechanics. It was almost developed at the similar time as special relativity and general relativity, and even though those were great, great discoveries, 
quantum mechanics still surpasses the, the, the impact of, of that revolution because you essentially realize, because that's one of the things I emphasized at the beginning that we're using our senses. Our senses don't work at all for microscopic phenomena and they are described by quantum mechanics. Uh, we can describe them because we can use mathematics and extrapolate. Um, but it was very difficult to understand with our own intuition because the, the behavior is very different, very, very uh, anti-intuitive. For instance, I have here this typical experiment. You send a light, for instance, through two, th uh, to, to a, a screen with two, sli uh, yes, two slits. And then the light being a wave, it has different patterns and you have interference and you have different colors and so on. And that's a wave behavior. It so happened that if you send no, no, not light, but you said electrons, which are particles, and it has a similar pattern. So the electrons behave like a wave and as a particle. And the same thing with light. Light behaves as a wave and as a particle. Something is completely anti-intuitive, and that's something that's is, is a, So you say, well, you send an electron to one of the, the slits, where does it happen? It pass through one or through the other one? It actually passes through the whole thing like a wave, and then you see the pattern in the, in the, in the screen on top. So that's one of, of the strange things of quantum mechanics. People that, I mean, it started with ideas of Planck. Einstein made a major contributions, and then the final theory was by Heisenberg and uh, Schrodinger, who developed uh, the, the theory of quantum mechanics. One of the things that is important related to what I told you uh, the first slide is the concept of quantum fluctuations. So you have, for instance, a particle with, in, inside of a bowl, say. What you expect is that after some time, the the particle just stays there because it's, this, it's the minimum energy. You just stay there, just plug in, plug in some place, and then it starts, and then it stays there. So that's naive expectation, that's classical physics. In quantum physics, that cannot happen. It is always fluctuating, just moving back and back. This is because of what is called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. That we don't know, this is the, what we don't know about x, this is what we don't know about momentum, which is essentially the velocity. The product of the two has to be bigger than one quantity called h bar, and h bar is one of the other constants of nature, which is, has this value. And uh, <clears throat> so, if h bar were zero, then we will be the classical world. So, this, we don't have uncertainty on position, no velocity. But since h bar is different from zero, if we know the velocity well, we don't know the position. We don't know, if we know the position well, we don't know the velocity. Because this, the, in, in the indeterminacy, is the product of these two has to be bigger than this amount. And these quantum fluctuations are the same thing that I was telling you about the scoping microwave background, that I told you the difference of colors in the, in the microwave background. Those are precisely computed to be quantum fluctuations. So these quantum phenomena, which are microscopic in our world, now are manifested microscopically by seeing the whole structure of galaxies and so on, these fluctuations that happened at the beginning. As I said, they were expanded by the expansion of the universe, and thus the whole structure of the universe we have are quantum fluctuations. So we can, we can see that if we want to, we, someone asks us what is our origin, it will, our origin will be quantum fluctuations in the early universe, out of this type. So this is a great uh, discovery within quantum mechanics, and that has been uh, developed for more than for a century or so. And uh, on top of all this in interesting phenomena, which is understanding, quantum mechanics has been the main uh, source of all the great uh, advances in technology over the past century, from lasers to semiconductors, uh, computers, and so on. So essentially, it's tested experimentally, it's, it's, uh, it's very well founded uh, uh, theoretically, and has a lot of uh, applications. The quant quantum mechanics also uh, gave the strong foundations of, of, of the idea of the atom. Here is Richard Feynman, who's probably the greatest physicist, uh, the hero of many of, many of us, the greatest physicist of the second half of the last century. And he, I will, let me read this, what statement he said, because it's, it's very strong. He said that if in some cataclysm, all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed, and only one sentence passed on the next generation of creatures, what statement will contain the most information in the fewest words? And he said, I believe it is the atomic hypothesis, that all things are made of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are a little distance apart, or repelling upon being squeezed into one another. In that one sentence, you will see there is an enormous amount of information about the world, if just a little imagination and thinking are applied. So essentially, he claimed that the most important thing that we have that we know this, that essentially everything we know is made out of atoms. And here is probably, you, you all have seen that in your school, 
uh, the famous periodic table that Mendeleev came out with after trying to suffering a, a lot to try to make sense of many of the elements that were discovered at that time, and quantum mechanics makes sense of them because then you can see what an atom is. It's a nucleus surrounded by electrons. Without classical, without quantum mechanics, those electrons will be uh, uh, going around. They will be unstable because they will radiate and they will collapse to the to the to the nucleus. In quantum mechanics, that is stable, and then you can explain the whole structure of the atoms by different layers and so on of, uh, by, by, by the principle of quantum mechanics. So that was a major uh, achievement of the idea of quantum mechanics and a major unification again. Now, now we understand the, the working of each of these elements in the periodic table. I said there was unification of relativity, of space and time, and unification in quantum mechanics, waves and particles. Uh, then you can wonder, well, can you have a unification of the two of them, special relativity and quantum mechanics? Can uh, waves and particles be unified by space and time? And uh, actually, that's what uh, uh, Dirac did so in the 1930s, and then several people developed further something called quantum field theory that we all think is the basis of our understanding of, of, of fundamental nature now. And uh, so it started by Dirac describing the, how the, the, the equation that describes an electron in a relativistic way is consistent, quantum mechanics, and it's special relativity, not general relativity. Special relativity and quantum mechanics. That was in the 30s, so we are getting closer to our time. In the 40s, these ideas were used by Tomonaga, Schwinger, and Feynman to describe what is called quantum electrodynamics. The ideas of, I told you before about, about Maxwell, with the Maxwell's equations describing electricity and magnetism and so on, now you have to make that consistent with the idea of quantum mechanics. And the simple idea came out. You said, you, how does uh, two electrons interact with each other? They interact by exchanging another particle, which is called the photon. A photon is the particle of light. So this, what is an electromagnetic interaction? It's just exchange of photons. So that's, that's another unification that you can see. And uh, of course, this is the theory that has been tested with more, more precision in the history of science. A step further, in the 60s, Glashow, Salam, and Weinberg, they managed to do the same thing for another interaction. They didn't inter remember Maxwell unified electricity and magnetism. After all, during the 20th century, people discovered that there are other interactions, not only elect electromagnetism and gravity, but there are interactions on, at the, at the subatomic level, the things that keep the nucleus together by itself, they're called strong interactions. And another interaction which is responsible for it is called beta decay, it's called weak interactions. And the challenge was to describe these interactions, Weinberg, Salam, and Glashow, by describing them, they've managed to unify and realize that these weak interactions and the electromagnetic interactions were one and the same. It's another unification. That brings us to the standard model. The standard model is the model that we all believe is true. Whether we like it or not, it is true. With it. It satisfies all the experiments that have been tested so far. And as I told you at the beginning, the discovery of the Higgs particle was uh, a proof that the, late, the last thing that was needed to, to, to test this, uh, this model, and it was discovered precisely as expected. The standard model, essentially, you have only two types of particles for matter, called leptons, for which the electron and the neutrino are, are, are the prime examples. You have other particles called quarks, and essentially the neutron and the proton and many other hundreds of particles, which are called hadrons, they are all made out of quarks. It's another simplification by unifications that they are all made of what's small particles called quarks. And those are the, all, the, all the atoms that we see in the universe are just made out of quarks and electrons going around. And then the neutrinos are there. They are, they are responsible, for instance, for the process that hits the sun. And if you open your hand at any time, you, there's hundreds of thousands of millions of, of, of uh, neutrinos passing our hand without us noticing it because they interact very weakly. So there's particles that are there. And the, all the forces that we know, they're called by other particles called, uh, called bosons. And, and the forces are mediated by particles. As I told you, electromagnetism is mediated by the photon. The weak forces by three, four, three particles that were discovered in the 1980s, Ws and Zs. And another, the strong force that keeps the quarks together to make nu uh, neutrons and protons are uh, uh, held together by a particle called the gluon. On top of this particle, we have the Higgs. These particles have properties called a spin. This is half an entity, a spin one half. This has spin one. And the Higgs is the simplest of all of them. It has, has no spin, so no, no internal uh, rotation. For gravity, the story is more difficult. 
Gravity is supposed to be mediated by another particle, or spin two, it's more complicated than spin. And uh, we don't know how to describe it on the quantum level, and that's what we say is the major problem of physics, only classical. So we can see the gravitational waves that I, was, I told you at the beginning, is a classical manifestation of this gravity, but we don't see the, the particle itself. So this is uh, uh, the same story about the four interactions, and the, that means all the nuclei and, the, and atoms of, of, the, of, the, of the periodic table that I, I told you. And, and, uh, and again, these are the particles, the quarks, and the leptons, and the, the graviton. This slide is a bit old, so you had a star here of not, not yet confirmed, so now it's confirmed. So the Higgs is confirmed. There's no doubt that it is there. So only the graviton is less left to be found. So this standard model satisfies every single experiment we make in, 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 in any experiment. It's arguably probably the greatest theoretical achievement in the past 75 years. And I started my talk with the greatest discoveries in the past 25 years, which were experimental. This is, takes longer to confirm as a theoretical idea as 75 years that have been people building up this standard model from quantum electrodynamics until now. It is a simple model, but it's not the simplest. It's, some, it's good to know. It is ugly. You know, with physics, we try to find beauty in what we do. And the model is ugly, we have to admit. Uh, however, the principles behind are beautiful. They are based on symmetries. And symmetries are always beautiful. And the same principle that gave Einstein his ideas of special relativity was principles of, print, of symmetries. And in that sense, you have to keep in mind that the beauty is in the principles, not in the particular numbers that test with experiments, but there are many free parameters that we don't know what they are and so on. And important to know, the standard model is not complete. We don't know everything in nature because we don't know why we are made of particles and not antiparticles. I forgot to say, when Dirac made his, his unification of uh, special relativity and quantum mechanics, he predicted that there had to be, for every particle you see, there has to be another particle called an antiparticle that will annihilate each other, annihilate with the original particle. And they have been detected since the 1930s. There's no mystery about antiparticles. Antiparticles exist, and we, we know all the antiparticles of all the particles. But what we don't know is why is it that we are made of particles and not antiparticles? What created that asymmetry? And that is an open question. That's something to There's something called dark matter. I will enhance uh, later on that we know it exists because it's been tested that, that there's something more in the universe that we don't see. And we don't see this because we have been exploring the universe mostly by, by electromagnetic waves, which is a, a photon. But it is in, this presence is indicated by their interaction, like a gravitational interaction and so So it has to be there. Some more particles that we don't know what they are. And that's called dark matter. But the standard model, as again, just to say, it can be simplified, a very simple equation. You can describe everything. This, this describes gravity. This describes the other interactions. This describes the uh, quarks and the leptons, the interactions of them with the Higgs and the energy for the Higgs. And that you can just write in one equation and get everything you want. By the way, we sell these uh, mugs for four euros in our institute. So. <clears throat> there are t-shirts also, if you want, you're interested eventually. So, and an example for the application of the, of the standard model is our universe, our universe itself. So let me go quickly. So this is, this is an enhanced version of the picture I showed you before. So this is the Big Bang. We don't know what happened. This is the, we don't know what happened because we don't know what gravity is at the microscopic level. But immediately after that, there's this potential expected period of inflation where these quantum fluctuations give rise to the temperature fluctuation in the cosmic microwave background that I told you before. And then over the years, over, over the time, things happen. That, uh, for instance, the first uh, <coughs> uh, nuclei were formed. The, the, so the, the you can see the quarks become making uh, neutrons and so on. Then what happens uh, after 300,000 years, the, the, the universe became electrically neutral. The, the protons trapped the electrons. They were all like uh, colliding with each other like a soup. At some point, the universe is expanding. When it expands, it gets colder and colder. So the energy, and since the temperature is related to the motion of the particles, so now these particles move slower. And since they are, they're moving slower, they can be trapped by the attraction, for instance, the electron can be trapped by the attraction of the proton and, and makes what? A hydrogen atom. So the first atom is 
Before that, they were colliding with the photons, the particle of light, and they were all just colliding one into each other. After it became neutral, then the particle of light uh, became independent, just, just uh, uh, move out uh, by itself, and that's the radiation we have been seeing, this cosmic microwave background radiation. So what we are seeing, and we discovered in the 1960s, was precisely the moment where the first atoms were formed. So imagine how detailed we can say about the universe. We can just see by seeing this microwave background that some of us can even detect it by in our television, the old kind of televisions, we can see the, some of the signal there. Uh, uh, it, it is exactly telling us what the moment where the first atoms were formed. And after that, because of gravity, the, the, the interaction became like neutral, so the only interaction that dominated was gravity. Then because of its attraction, these fluctuations are, uh, make that some, uh, in some places they were ma more matter than others, so they attracted each other because of gravity. They created the galaxies, the stars, and so on, and that's how we came up. So the sensor that's the picture. With the small detail, the small quote unquote, is that now we are accelerating again, and this is dark energy that we do not understand. And that's where, that's where we are. Again, as I say, the cosmic microwave background was discovered in the 60s. It looked identical in all directions. Then in the 90s, now people discovered different temperatures, and now it's getting closer and closer. And the, the difference in temp uh, is, is you can see with much more precision, and agrees with this idea of inflation, although, yeah. Okay, so but there are open questions, and the open question is why? Why things are as they are? Do we want to understand things? That's what science is about. One of the questions is why we live in three special dimensions at one time? Why not less or why not more? That's one. Why there are several classes of quarks and leptons? Why not only one? That's a family. Why there are four interactions, electro electromagnetic, weak, strong, and gravity? Why four, four or not more? And why do they behave like that? That's some question we know. There are these 20 parameters that I told you, the masses of the particles and so on, that makes the theory ugly. We don't know why, why they take the value they take. There are some issues of naturalness. We don't think that should be small. Uh, the thing that theoretically should be big, like the mass of the Higgs, end up to be very small, and we don't know why. And the dark energy, the big mystery of dark energy, is why this acceleration is, 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 is it creates what is called energy of the, of, of, of the vacuum. Why it's so small? And it's small. It's the smallest number you can imagine. It's zero point hundred and twenty zeros one. This is a very small number. Why is that? number like that, we don't know. And uh, yes, the cosmology, the, the dark matter, biogenesis, the, per, the perturbation of the cosmic microwave background, uh, the Big Bang itself, and consistency. If we try to do the Einstein theory of gravity consistent with quantum mechanics, we fail. Everybody fails. And that's the most important problem in physics is that one, how to make consistent the theory of gravity of Einstein with quantum mechanics. This is another picture about the dark energy that we don't know. And the distribution of energy in the universe is, you can see how small we are. Again, thinking about uh, Copernicus, 73% of the energy of the universe is, is dark energy. 20 something percent is dark matter. And small, less than 4% is made out of the particles of the standard model, including ourselves. So our universe is mostly made of things that we don't know. Dark matter we don't know. Dark energy, we don't know. So that's a big mystery. The evidence for dark matter is, is compelling. The behavior of rotation of uh, cores in galaxies and so on, it should behave like this. The, 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 the should be uh, slower with the distance, but it happens to be constant with the distance. And that means that there is another matter there that is, 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 is uh, 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 modifying the, 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 the attraction for, for, for the subjects so that they, they, they uh, they have its faster motions, and we don't know why. I, we don't, and this is strong evidence of separating in a, what's called the coma cluster, two, two ways of seeing the, 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 the this cluster with the visible and with the non-visible part, and the two different colors tell you that one is dark matter. There's a presence of dark matter. As I told you, the fundamental problem is gravity. Gravity, as Einstein told us, is just the curvature of space and time. When you go smaller and smaller distances, the same the concept itself of what space-time is is not clear. So that's why we have these kind of fluctuations. Again, quantum fluctuations. That, that, that when you go to Einstein, tells us space and time is gravity. If you go quantum mechanics, tells us that everything is fluctuates because of the Heisenberg principle. When you go to, to the distances where quantum gravity is irrelevant, when 
gravity is relevant at a microscopic level, then the space and time itself starts fluctuating, and then we don't know what the space time is, and that's a, the major question. And there are some scales, but it's like Planck again, combining the sum, the, some of the concepts of uh, nature that I showed you before, the constant for quantum, the constant for relativity, and the constant for gravity, you combine them together and give you an energy which is very big. 10 to 19 is 10 to with 19 sphere. Uh, uh, GeV is the mass of the proton, so it's 10 to 19 heavier than the proton. This mass is the relevant scale where gravity effects, where quantum effects are relevant for gravity. You move that to the distances. The distance is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. It's very, very, very small. Uh, and for time, it's 10 to the minus 44 seconds. So that tells you that for distances smaller than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, nobody can tell you what physics is about. Okay. And look, then tell you that the scale here of scale that we know. Here is our side, one meter. This is the Planck scale, the 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And here is the scale that the highest uh, colliding, uh, uh, colliders are exploring, 10 to the minus 18. It's only, only half way. So this is where our experiments can probe. This is what we want to have quantum gravity effects. So we have many, many orders of magnitude that we don't have any techniques to test. So any theory, any theory that I can tell you of, that pretends to describe gravity at the microscopic level cannot be tested experimentally because we don't have any experiment that can, be test, can test distances more than 10 to the minus 18 meters. So that's that statement. So how do you see small distances? So anybody has an idea how we see? So we can see up to one millimeter or so with our eyes. Beyond that, what do we use, what do we use to see smaller distances? Microscopes, very good. We can go smaller and smaller, but at some point when we hit the size of the, the atoms, what can we do? Or well, the size of the neutrons, what can do? Uh, the, the nucleus, what can we do? That's what the colliders are. So this LHC collider at CERN, when colliding particles have very high uh, energies, they have high momenta, so then the distance is, is small. That's the, 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 the biggest, the, the most efficient microscope we have. So the smaller distance we can explore is through these colliders that we have, for instance, at CERN colliding particles. You have high momentum, high velocity, then in small distances. Again, delta x, delta p. And, uh, so, and they, do, they explore these distances. So we have this problem. So this is a major problem in physics. Theories, we can speculate a lot, but we know that our experimentalist friends, they, they have limitations. They cannot explore. Uh, so you want to have an experiment that tests these distances, you have to have a collider of uh, the size of the galaxy or so. So we cannot do it. So, so that's a major challenge for every single theory that wants to describe gravity at the microscopic level. So we have to rely on the other techniques we have, which are quantum about, uh, mathematics and consistency, logical consistency, and then leave the experimental test for the future. That brings to string theory. So string theory is in the stages of unification. This is the next stage. This is the idea that can, that can try to unify every single interaction that we have seen with every single particle that we have seen. And on top of that, solve the problem of gravity at the quantum level, at microscopic level. Unfortunately, I'm telling you already since the beginning, we cannot test it directly because of the previous slide. We don't know how to test it at, at the distances so small that, uh, that quantum effects are important. But let me tell you what string theory is about. Essentially, every particle, when, when I told you about a particle, the electron also, we always think about point objects. String theory tells you, no, no, they're not point objects. When you look with a uh, magnifying glass, they are things that look like a point, they're actually little strings. Can be closed or open, and that every particle we see are different strings. But the difference is that the oscillations of those strings give you different frequencies, and the frequencies give you different masses, and then all the particles that we can see in principle can be explained as different oscillation modes of the, of the strings. So in that sense, it's a very unifying concept. In particular, one of the particles that you produce with this is the particle of gravity, the graviton. So particle looks like strings. Gravity is included. You, so always you have, so let's, these are a part of the magnifying glass, you see the strings open and close. And uh, <clears throat> gravity is not included, it's predicted. Every, every, when you work in string theory, you have to have a particle that behaves like the graviton. So gravity is predicted, it's very important. And for all the other particles that we can see, this, like a standard model, uh, all the particles are interactions, the, what people call the Einstein's dream, are incorporated in string theory. But it also predicts things that we were not expecting, like uh, that we live in 10 or 11 dimensions. So I told you 
we live in three dimensions, space and time. So what happened to the uh, string theory tells you, well, we live actually in more dimensions. So that's the prediction. So, so we have to see what happened. What can be the extra dimensions? The extra dimensions can be small enough that we cannot detect because we, I told you we can detect distances up to the 10 to the minus 18 meters. It's smaller than that, we cannot detect. So the extra dimensions can have that size. And the progress in the last 10 or 15 years is that we have been able to find solutions of string theory where you can find the sizes of the, of the extra dimensions to be small and then get only the four dimensions that we see. <clears throat> and then predicts other things, which is other uh, uh, symmetry called supersymmetry that uh, I will explain here. This is, I'm sorry, this is an old slide. I, I cannot, I, don't, I haven't found a way to modify it. And uh, <clears throat> so the idea of supersymmetry is, uh, is that for every particle that we know, there is a super particle that we don't know and it hasn't been observed and it's heavier than the one that we know. Okay, so, it's, okay? so that's, that's the idea of supersymmetry. And it is very nice because for instance, if the electron, you have the electron, there has to be a partner called the super electron. For a photon, the super partner of the photons is a photino and so on. For every particle we know, there has to be another particle. And that's the kind of thing that people are searching at CERN in the Coral. That's probably the main thing they have been searching after discovering the Higgs. Unfortunately, they haven't found anything yet. So this is, but uh, that's, you know, string theory predicts supersymmetry, but doesn't tell you how heavy these objects are. So it can be heavy enough that, heavy enough that we don't see by the colliders. You can, you can have many, many, many orders of magnitude of energy that we can go into the, the this energy that is explored at CERN compared to the energy that we can have. But uh, it will be, if they discover supersymmetry, that would be a great thing for string theory. If they don't discover it, we cannot say anything. So this is the idea of they have many particles, and some of them can be candidates for dark matter. The beautiful supersymmetry that we make experiments at a, at a given scale. These are the other three interactions, no gravity. And uh, electromagnetic, weak, and, 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 sorry, and, and strong interactions, they look different because they have different couplings, but they change with energy. And with supersymmetries at a very high energy, they uh, get unified at one single value. Without supersymmetry, they don't get unified. So that's the, and, and that's precisely the, what the experiments are telling us. They're evolving such that it looks unification with, uh, with um, uh, supersymmetry. So that's the, the only uh, indication we have that there may be something and energy is very, very high. This is, this is close to the Planck scale. This is the scale that we are exploring in the experiments. And with supersymmetry, it tells us that all these forces that look different at some point become one single coupling. So there will be a unification of electromagnetic, uh, weak, and strong forces. So that's, well, the pre uh, string theory predicts that we can live in a brain or a wall. I, I will not, I'm, I'm seeing the time is getting shorter, so I will go. The theory is unique. It's one single theory, but there may be many solutions. So what you expect of a fundamental theory is to be unique. It's one theory, it's unique. But once you have a theory, you look for potential solutions of the theory. Each solution of the theory, like you have an equation, you look for solutions of the equation. Each solution is a different universe. So the fact that the theory is unique doesn't mean that it has only one solution. Actually, the generic thing that you have many solutions. So, and that is interesting because then you can have naturally many universes. And how is that you have many universes? Because the extra dimensions that I told you, which are very small, have to be very small because they, they can have a lot of size and shapes, very complicated. So that, that depending on which the nature of the extra dimensions are, then that will give you different universes in our three plus one uh, dimensions. I will go into the details. Precisely this, this idea that you have many universes is such that you have so many, many universes. This problem about the the dark energy may be addressed. It's not the most beautiful solution, but it's the only one in town <laughs> and the world, and it's the only one for 50 years or so. That uh, because there are many, many, many universes, we can only in the universes where the dark energy has the value that I told you it is, 10 to the minus 120, we very small. We can live in other universes. We cannot live. So why do we live in? in why does that? quantity has that value, which is very small, is because if it were a bit bigger, the universe will expand too fast, and will, there will not be galaxies. It will be smaller, the, it will be collapse very fast, and you will be no galaxies. So it has to have the right value for us to be here. So in that sense, it is, we as scientists don't like this what's called anthropic explanation, and uh, many people refuse to accept. On the other hand, we cannot tell 
the theory, what, you know, we cannot tell nature what we like and what we don't like. Essentially, we have to be open-minded and see what, what, what comes out. So essentially, the best explanation there is for dark energy at the moment is that there are many universes, and they come out very naturally from string theory. So this is the idea of many universes. You span and collapse one, and then create another universe, another universe, another universe, and you can have an infinite number of universes. So each, our universe can be just this part here, when you have the big, what we call the Big Bang here, will be expanding. At some point, it will give rise to other universes and so on. Like uh, in biology, you can you get rise to baby universes and big ones to the uh, grandchildren and so on. It's interesting that there's always a beginning. <laughs> this, uh, that we cannot avoid, even if there, you have many universes. Okay, so let me try to, I have several more slides, but I can see uh, time is getting short. Right? A, so, <clears throat> People have been making progress. Uh, the, for instance, right now we're having this conference, which is called String Phenology, looking for phenomena out of string theory. Um, the progress has been made continuously over the last 30 years. It's, uh, as I tried to, to justify since the beginning, theory develops very slow, and, and to be tested is even slower. Think about Einstein predicting gravitational waves, and detected being 100 years later. But, to make progress, we have to work. You know, it's not just a question of waiting 100 years and see what happens. You have to work during those 100 years. And that's what we are doing at the moment. And uh, so there's cumulative uh, progress. For instance, there are candidates from string theory that give you inflation, candidates that give you dark matter, this is for dark energy, and so on. So there are things that share the open questions that are, in, this is, have been, are being addressed at the moment in string theory with more or less success. There's something called the swamp land. It's become very popular now. The, the many universes that I told you is called the landscape, and the swampland is that universes that cannot be consistent with the quantum gravity with string theory, and that with a, we will have to think otherwise that they will be there. So this is the picture I, I stole from one of our colleagues with Irene Valenzuela. We have, these are the many, uh, this is of our four space-time dimensions, and then the extra dimensions are small, the sports time dimensions, extra dimensions. Different extra dimensions give you different universes here, and we can live in this region, but there are other universes where we cannot live, that, that, that are, are inconsistent with this uh, string theory. So we have many, many universes, but not everything that we can think is allowed. And now we're, people are trying to, to specify what is allowed, what is not allowed. So it's completely open. So there has some been concrete achievements. Uh, <clears throat> people are studying what happens, you get inflation, you get what happens after inflation, and so on. And let me just end up with another different development which is very, very interesting and, and, and strange, but it has been one of the main results in string theory in many, and in, in theoretical physics in many years. That's the concept of holography. The idea of holography is very strange and came out as a solution of string theory, is that they tell you that, again, a unification, a theory in five dimensions with gravity is equivalent to a theory in four dimensions without gravity. I told you that describing gravity is the most complicated problem we have, and happens to be a theory with gravity is equivalent to a theory without gravity, which we should be able to understand. And uh, that was very surprising. It's called what is called holography or ADS CFT, and, and that has given rise to a lot of uh, interesting developments theoretically. And uh, in particular, it, uh, it allowed to describe this equation. This equation for many people is the most beautiful equation ever. And I tell you. Uh, I, if you really remember on my first slides, there was this slide about the, the, the tombstone of Boltzmann. He wrote uh, uh, entropy S equals to K log of W. So this is the question that Stephen Hawking asked to be put in his tombstone, because he was involved with that. This BH sometimes means black hole, but some people can call it Bekenstein Hawking, mm -hmm. so it fits very well, <laughs> two, two three minutes. And this is entropy, which is a thermodynamic quantity, the measure of disorder, the second law of thermodynamics, and so on, is proportional to a geometric quantity, area. And the constant of proportionality, there's a famous four, there's the, you have to compute. Here's the Boltzmann constant, the speed of light, the Newton's constant, and the Planck's constant. All the constant I told you the, the, since the beginning, all the fundamental constants of nature, they are involved in one single equation relating to quantities which are completely separated. S is entropy of a black hole, and area is, A is the area of the black hole, what is called the horizon of the black hole. And uh, I told you that the relationship between microscopic and microscopic quantities, this quantity was computed by using string theory, counting states from a microscopic level, 
and they obtain exactly the same formula with a factor of four with all the constants and so on. So that's a, one of the major achievements. And uh, Stephen Hawking had worked on that for, for, uh, in the 1970s, and he had predicted this from one side, now it was computed using string theory. Uh, there is an interesting anecdote that I can tell you. Uh, he asked for this equation to be in his tombstone. Two weeks ago, we went uh, to, to the Westminster Abbey, when the, his ashes are now in, together with Newton and uh, Matt Darwin and so on. And to our surprise, they put a different equation. <laughs> So the people who decided about which equation to put, uh, they didn't listen to his uh, request, and uh, it's too late. And so they put the, entropy, the temperature equation, which is called the Hawking temperature. Uh, however, I, I happened to be in the same college as Stephen, and in the college we were making a special space for him, and we, we are writing this equation. So it will be someone will, will be, he will be remembered when he come to Cambridge to our college, and this equation will be there. Just to tell you how we take decisions, there was an exchange, here the exchange for 40 different emails, people arguing how to write this equation. <laughs> so, but uh, this is the way. Anyway, so in the future, what do the future expect? Experimentally driven, many things. We expect that still the Large Hadron Collider and the CERN can provide some. There are some particles called actions, very co common in string theory. People have been searching for them for 40 years. So for instance, if I would have been given this talk 10 years ago, I may not have mentioned gravitational waves because they have been trying to detect gravitational waves for many years. We didn't know when they're going to be disco discovered. So you can ask the question, what kind of things people have been searching for many years that have not yet been discovered, but they can be discovered soon? One of them is this particle called actions. That is very general in theory. Uh, <clears throat> other things which are, the proton is supposed to be, is, is stable by chance, but usually it can decay like many particles. And essentially, any theory beyond the standard model, the proton is unstable, it can decay. So since the 1970s, people have been devising experiments to see if the proton can decay. The lifetime is very big, so we ha it hasn't decayed yet. But I don't know, maybe in 10 years, we will see. So that's something that will give us the uh, indication of the scales very high from string theory. Something called cosmic strings that can be seen in the space and eventually. One, something that we are holding our breath is something called tensor mode. The cosmic microwave background, as I told you, these fluctuations I told you, it is, there are two types of, of fluctuations. So one of them has been discovered, that's what we have been studying, but there's another one called tensor modes, which are essentially gravitational waves from the cosmic microwave background. And if they discover that, that will be one of the main discoveries ever, because that will be telling us the, uh, the, the signature of the uh, evidence from, from what happened at the very, very, very beginning of the universe, essentially right after the Big Bang. And uh, probably you don't remember, like uh, five years ago, there was an announcement for an experiment called BICEP that they had discovered these tensor modes. And uh, I, many of us had one of the most exciting times of our lives for two months, thinking that it was true, and the experiment was wrong. And, uh, uh, but still people are searching for it, and hopefully in the next uh, five years we'll have more, more results on this. And there's something that we use at the moment besides that string theory is the main candidate, of, or essentially the only one that is providing this unification, but it's not the only one pr providing a candidate for quantum gravity, but the only one that gives unification. It still is not a well-defined theory. You have to work on that. Uh, you will not only know indication of the theory, it has to be understood properly, and that's something some of our colleagues are working on that. And uh, so to, there are many string models. Each one is a different universe. People have counted as numbers of 10 to the 500, or much, many more. But none of them has been found to be exactly realistic. You kind of, we haven't found exactly the standard model, for instance, from string theory. So the question is, are there too many models or too few? And since the numbers are so big, this is, fits very well with the new developments that people are working now on, on, on computer sciences. So this uh, techniques called machine learning. Now people are starting to use also in string theory because we have big, big numbers. And let me finish with optimistic perspective. So the typical statement people say, we do not understand well enough the string theory to try to extract its physics implications, so let's wait. The bold answer is, well, we actually may understand the theory much better than we think, and we have been using all the possible ingredients. And then I end up with this quote of, of Weinberg. He says something which is very wise. He said, our mistake is not that we take our theories too seriously, but we do not take them seriously enough. It is always hard to realize that these numbers and equations that we play with at our desks 
have something to do with the real world. And it's true, we're always working with mathematics and doing some calculations of computers or so. At some point, it's hard for us to, to imagine that this eventually can be tested, like uh, the discovery of the Higgs. It was done by calculations in the desk 40 years before, and then slowly thousands of people working together with a big accelerator, the score study the particle with the right properties. So this is sometimes not even us who work in the theory believe that, that, that we are touching with the, with the real world. So I think that's something to keep in mind. And uh, we'll continue our search for the fundamental theory. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I can also maybe repeat and stress once more that this lecture is not only the lecture of our series, but it's also a lecture, a part of the conference which is taking place this week and devoted mainly to the topics we heard at the end of the talk. So are there some questions? Thank you. Um, does string theory tackle the issue of uh, the cosmological constant in quantum field theory? Like it just, just collapses? Yes, very good. So let, let me just expand a bit on your question. The cosmological constant is a very interesting story also. The idea is the following. Einstein, when the, he came up with his famous theory of general relativity, he applied that to our universe and came out with a, a universe that was expanding. And at that time, he thought that the universe was static, so it didn't fit with his equations. So he added an extra term to his equation by hand, and that's called the cosmological constant. And with that term, it allowed him to get a static universe. Of course, after he did that, Hubble discovered that the universe is actually expanding. So Einstein called that it was the biggest blunder of his life to include the cosmological constant. And then he took it out. And then let's leave with that. So Einstein made several mistakes in this story. <laughs> First of all, the mistake of not adding this cosmological constant. He had to add it since the beginning. He had forgotten. It's not that he has a right to add it or not to add it. When you write your theory, he had to have written, that's the most important term in, the, in his equations was this constant. So he had made a mistake of not putting it. Then he put it by hand by just trying to solve a problem that was not there, that's not a mistake. And the third biggest mistake is that he took it out as if he had the right to set to zero the quantity. So that's a big mistake. Now we have much higher standards than Einstein in that sense. That uh, if something is zero, we have to explain why it's zero. And uh, he felt that he had the right just to set it to zero and then forget about that and that we cannot do that. And actually, when I was a student, the dream of most of us at that time was to prove why the cosmological constant was zero. That's, that's, that was the dream. But then people discovered this dark radiation. And that radiation, the best explanation for dark radiation is precisely this famous constant, which is a very small value, this 10 to the minus 120 that I told you. So that's the best solution for it. It fits very well with experiments, and the question is why it's so small. So in that sense, and it is a big problem. Why? Because that constant has units of uh, energy to the four or so. So when you put it in natural constants, that's why it should be uh, further one. And what we, uh, if to explain the expansion of the, the acceleration of the universe, it is this 10 to the minus 120. And every correction you make to that uh, value of that, because uh, 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 that's, that's a contribution that is called the vacuum energy, the energy of the vacuum. Any con any interaction, any particle, it contributes to the energy of the vacuum by an amount. So you have to cancel this 120 orders of magnitude order by order in your calculations, which is essentially uh, impossible. And string theory can explain, quote unquote, that by saying it doesn't matter how small it is. There are so many universes, so in, in one universe you cancel everything. It's the entropic. And that's the only solution. People don't like it. And whoever criticizes that, that theory, whoever laughs like you, cannot come up with any, any answer, any solution. And that's the best solution we have. Any people who have criticized that, they cannot come with any solution. So that's the best solution we have at the moment. It's, it's the only solution that makes sense. But we don't like it. We don't like it, but who, for nature, why nature cares whether we like it or not? <laughs> okay. So nature behaves in that way. And you have an explanation. This is the explanation. There are so many solutions, and the solutions are there. And, uh, so whoever don't uh, uh, find another solution, I can tell you I spent one year of my life trying to find another solution, even though I knew that, that this, because we, we prefer to find a better explanation. And, uh, 
but uh, this may be the only, the only way out, and that, that, that this could be the, 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 what nature is. So, and it is, in principle, it's not only string theory. In principle, it could be any theory that has many, many solutions that could give you that. And the distribution, the distribution of the solutions can, can, uh, uh, has to be that it's completely uniform, so you can pick one over the other ones. And uh, so, <clears throat> so the, and, and uh, another beautiful thing about that, again, Weinberg, showing us how great physicists should behave. In 1987, 10 years before they discovered dark energy, Weinberg predicted, he said, if the solution is anthropic, then it has to have this value. And then it was found precisely as, as he had predicted. So that's how science should be done. Take out all your biases and just do and, 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 and come up with concrete uh, uh, predictions of numbers and then see how it matches and then uh, see what happens. So in that sense, it was a, it's a very nice story to tell. I don't think we have seen the last part, because it's not only that you have many universes. Uh, you have to, to, to find explicitly the solutions. So you have to see if you can go from one universe to another one. And those things are not very underst clear understood. So in that sense, there's plenty to be done in this direction. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I think uh, dark matter, we think it's just another particle. And there's, it's, not a, it's mysterious because we don't know what it is, but we have seen other particles which are dark. The neutrinos I told you that we don't see and they are crossing our body by millions and millions per second. We don't see them, they are dark matter. Unfortunately, the, the neutrinos cannot, be, cannot explain the, 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 the large scale structure of the universe that is needed that dark matter to do. So the neutrinos, are not the dark matter that is, is, is keeping the, the large scale structure of the universe, so the evidence that people have been seeing experimentally. But, so that means that there has to be another particle. And people are searching for dark matter in different uh, experiments, uh, direct searches, indirect searches, and so they search for actions, which are all, all potential dark matter candidates, and even at CERN, there's, there's particles that are supersymmetric, for instance, some of them are dark matter candidates. So dark matter, we can be optimistic that in the next I don't know, 10, 15 years, something can be found. Dark energy is the other way around. It is there, because we know it, it has been found. The problem is that we, we don't know what it is. So that dark energy, uh, you have the, 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 the span, this universe is accelerating, so we, 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 we know it's accelerating. The question is what it is. So the, first, the simplest explanation is that it is this vacuum energy, the famous cosmological constant of Einstein. That gives you a prediction of a quantity called the equation of a state, is the ratio of pressure divided by energy density. That has to be, if it is the cosmological constant, that quantity has to be exactly minus one. And people have been measuring that quantity for several experiments, and it's minus 0.96 or something like that. So it's very close to minus one. So it's, that is very, if it is not the cosmological constant, it's very, very, very close to be a cosmological constant because it's essentially fitting with experiments. So in that sense, the cosmological constant is not only the simplest, but it's the thing that fits much better with experiments. So, so far, it's okay. And people are going to improve on this measure of this quantity to, to say, one order of magnitude or so. So if it gets closer and closer to minus one, we get more and more confident that it is a cosmological constant. And then that still has to be leave open why the cosmological constant is so small, and that's, as I said, the, f the only explanation we have is the anthropic uh, uh, argument. That, uh, by the way, let, let me say something more on the anthropic because it's just usually, uh, as I told you in one of the slides at the beginning, we have to use, first of all, uh, uh, our brain to, 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 to address uh, uh, the issues, and the first thing is curiosity. We have to ask questions. So we have to know what quest which questions are good questions and which questions are not good questions. So this cosmological constant or dark uh, energy, we thought that it was a good question. And the same, that reminds us of an interesting case in, in the time of Kepler. Kepler, when he was studying the motion of the planets, he wanted to explain the distance of the Earth to the Sun. He wanted to come that, that to come out, out of a calculation. And he failed. And then after all that, people realized that it is the wrong question. Why? Because you cannot calculate from first principle the distance of Earth to the Sun because there are other planets. There's uh, Saturn and Jupiter and so they have different distances. So the distance of the Earth to the Sun is not, it's not a particularly important number because there are many other distances. And so then why do we live in the Earth and not in Mar Mars or Jupiter? Because 
in Mars and Jupiter would be too cold, we couldn't live there, and in Venus would be too hot, so we can only live in the Earth. So, that's, so that means that what Kepler was trying to explain was not a good question. The good question was to explain how the orbits behave and so on that applies to any planet. So the cosmological constant may be of that source. It can be a bad question <laughs> in the sense that the answer is we live in this universe and not in other ones. It's the same way by why we live on Earth and not on Mars. And so that was not a good question. But there are many other good questions that we can ask from a string theory that we can, it can be tested experimentally. And that's what that will give strength to, to the theory. Yeah, there are some more questions. Uh, Einstein showed us that um, gravity we can see as a curvature of space-time. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the reason for to search to, to, to see to search for for graviton, and for, to, to search, search for, for graviton? Uh, yes. Do you, hold on, hold on. One, one more. Uh, do you believe that uh, space-time can be quantified, or is it or is it continuous? Yes, okay. I think this is a very good, good points. Yes, so. Yes, uh, Einstein showed that yes, space-time has a curve, a curve, but that's only cl a classical. Sorry, is that okay? That's only a classical uh, statement. The existence of a particle called graviton is a quantum. So, the, uh, like a photon being the mediator of the electromagnetic interactions, graviton is the mediator, is the mediator of gravity interactions in a quantum mechanical way. For that, Einstein had nothing to say. It was interesting that in the 1960s, Feynman and Weinberg came out with a completely different version of what gravity is. And it's, for me, is one of the most uh, elegant uh, uh, discoveries from uh, what field theory is. So they, they just simply try to understand particles, massless particles of different spins. Spin zero, spin one half, spin one, and spin two. And they stop there. And they have good arguments not to go beyond two. So two is the maximum. And happen to be particles of spin two. They just describe what kind of interaction it has and behaves precisely like Einstein predicted. So you didn't need to have any idea of course space times or, or things like that. They just try to describe what is the physics of a particle of spin two, and you, get, you can just reproduce uh, uh, relativity, like Einstein's theory. Of course, they did it 45 years or so after Einstein, but, but it, it's a nice understanding. It helps you in understanding because it's much more comprehensive. I usually emphasize that the fundamental theories that we have now are special relativity and quantum mechanics, not general relativity. General relativity is just one particular case because one interaction is gravity, but there are many other interactions. Special relativity and quantum mechanics, and combining these two, you get to particles of different spins, and then you can describe how they behave. And uh, the spin one behaves like electromagnetism, and spin two behaves like gravity. So in that sense, uh, that, that, that uh, strengthens the idea that from a qu quantum treatment, the graviton should be there. The reason it has not been discovered, of course, is because it's extremely weak compared to, to other interactions. Now, the second point I think is very important. As I say, <clears throat> space and time are just microscopic entities. And we can think about them like a, we think about temperature. You know, then we, you go microscopic, the temperature is just the motion of particles. So something like that can happen with the space and time. When you go to small distances, again, the uh, Heisenberg principle tells you that that we, we don't have the good definition of distance at, at very small uh, 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 distances, of course. So, uh, and then the, the, the general belief for essentially everybody who has been thinking about the uh, quantum aspects of gravity, being a string theory or being something else, because there are other people working in quantum gravity which are not string theory, uh, essentially the general belief that the uh, space and time it loses its fundamental nature when you go at the microscopic level. And it has to be replaced by some other effects. So at some point, space and time are emergent quantities. The best example we have about that is precisely this holography I told you. Holography is precisely because in a surface, we can see what happened in the whole bulk. For instance, uh, I say it's a four-dimensional theory. It's equivalent to a five-dimensional theory. So from that perspective, <clears throat> the fifth dimension, the fifth-dimensional theory is emerging somehow. So it wasn't there in, in the four-dimensional version. So this is a co very concrete way to see that, that uh, you can have a space emerging. Now, nobody has succeeded to have time emerging. 
And uh, so people are discussing now. So is, there is a lot of discussion which are very interesting at the moment. Uh, also related with the idea of quantum entanglement, the famous entanglement of quantum. And people say, can say that two particles are entangled quantum mechanically. Maybe the measure of how entangled those particles are is you can uh, transfer that to a notion of distance. And you can start defining what space and time means depending, uh, using with the, uh, the pure quantum uh, concept which is entanglement. Yeah. So there is a famous phrase that uh, John Wheeler had, which is uh, one of the greatest scientists. Of the, uh, he was the supervisor of Feynman. He came out with a say that the information is the basis of everything. And he came out with this beautiful phrase which is called uh, it from bit. So essentially, it is matter from bit which is information. So everything has to come out from information. Now, the modern times, the, the people modify by it from qubit because qubit is the quantum. Uh, information part. So I think there's something there. It's still very early to judge because people are just speculating in one way or another. The interesting thing is that there's a lot of disagreement of how to treat quantum gravity. String theory is the main uh, approach, but there are others. But essentially, everybody agrees that uh, space and time will lose its fundamental nature when you try to describe it quantum mechanically. And that I think is, is I, 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 I tend to agree with that. Well, maybe just one more question. Uh, thank you. My question is about a standard model and a, a Higgs boson. Uh, why uh, on your diagram and uh, most I've seen, the, uh, it is uh, the uh, boson, uh, Higgs boson is uh, set separate from it. It's not considered a force carrier. Uh, and. Uh, is there some reason for that, why bos uh, Higgs boson is not a force carrier and the Higgs mechanism is not a, uh, another fundamental interaction? Or is it just a convention not to add yeah, another yeah. one? Yes, that's a fair question. I think I agree with you. With you yes, we tend to call the, the, yes, the force carriers are the, the gluons, the photon, and the Ws and Z. They all have spin one. And the Higgs happened to be spin zero. It is a boson like the other ones, so in that sense, it shares many of the properties. So it can actually be called a, a new force in that sense. So it's a different, just a, because there, there are interactions of Higgs with the fermions, and that, that can be said as, 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 an, as, as a mediator of interactions. Uh, so in that sense, it, it can be called like that, but just a question of name. Uh, but it, it, we have to make clear that it's different from all the other ones because it has spin zero. It is interesting. Having a spin zero is interesting because it's supposed, you know, the smaller the spin, it's supposed to be the simplest. And we had discovered spin one, a spin one half before, and, and the spin series only the Higgs, and, and, and this is, is uh, so it's surprising that, that the simplest one we discovered uh, later. And so in that sense, that's why it's treated in a different way. Now, the Higgs has, plays other roles, like for instance, by coupling to the other particles, it contributes to the mass of the particles. So that's why people were making such a big importance of the Higgs, and is the, is the, I didn't emphasize, but it is the source of what people, people call this uh, symmetry breaking. There was a symmetry, and but the Higgs, since it has no spin, it can take a value in the vacuum without breaking the symmetries of special relativity. So that that's, can generate scales and so on, and that's why, why it's important for, for, for the masses of the particles. So that's, those aspects of the Higgs are the ones that are emphasized. But if you want to call it an interaction, I think it can be, it can be called because it just interacts with, with the different fermions, with the quarks and leptons and so on. There was a question here. Okay, so oh, we sorry. have some limitations tonight, but oh, well, that could okay. be the last one. Perhaps my question is too complicated because I'm a computer scientist from mathematical and physical background, and my question would be about your claim about fundamentality of physical theories versus not physical but scientific theories concerning society as such and information exchange languages and computer science, for example, enabled you, a physicist, to make simulation on supercomputers instead of building yet another machine like Large Hadron Collider. There was a struggle about the funds when the computer scientists proffered, please physicists simulate this. You, you could also multiply the number of tools to say computer or something like similar with software is also a tool. Absolutely. And there are some rules because of many parameters which are open in many of those models. My question is very philosophical or general one. Could we imagine that like Ptolemaic universe before Copernicus has many those 
uh, parameters uh, not decided because the center was at the uh, at this earth and putting the center to the uh, sun simplified the, the model. To, but gradually, uh, in the history of mathematics, we have come to simplify from spheres to ellipses and ellipses and so on. And the point, the general point would be, if you include in the scientific theories those theories about society and evolution of society with gauge, gauge theory in society. So society developing and changing understanding of itself. So it is non-linearity in social theories. And okay. not all physical models correspond to, uh, so let's say, 16th century society. We are rather having those models because we have our, uh, our, uh, our instruments. So this is my question is about anthropic principle. Is it really, in your picture, this anthropic principle taken seriously or it is an option which is not that much serious. Yes. This is no, the no. point. No, thank you for the... No, this, this, anthropic the simply, this is we, the language. Mm -hmm. And the final point would be, Professor from Warsaw, this Finnish physics department, Professor uh, Blickle, no, not Blickle, but this, uh, there are two brothers, uh, Birula Białynicki and Ivo. Ivo Białynicki has a daughter. This daughter uh, has written a book in some 20 years ago. I have noticed in Politechnika Warszawska that the first edition in Polish, this book, has no uh, par paragraph about language. And in English, this has about the models. We are in Poland, <laughs> semantic models, that language by Tarski and so on. So I, I discovered that Professor Blickle, as a father of this lady, has helped her, or some reviewers have helped her to instruct physicists that computers, modeling, and languages, and programming languages are important in modeling and thinking about the world. So the second edition in English included the paragraph about the modeling and uh, okay. languages. Let, let, let me try to say that. The first, first it does not. On the so first this is the point the why I'm saying about this uh, anthropic principle. Okay, let, let, let me try to, to, to address some of the points you mentioned. Uh, yes. Uh, the relationship with computer science, I think, is very, very interesting. And as now people are just starting to make this. Uh, 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 approach. There's a, I would like to approach first the computer science and then the anthropic part again. The computer science is a, uh, probably you have as here there's recent this the, the development in machine learning that there's the famous game called, called Go. That uh, you know, many years ago the computers were able to beat the chess champion. Now Go is a different game in in in, in Asia. It's much more complicated than chess. And then the machine was taught uh, last year, but teaching, learning by itself, that uh, the, uh, without any human intervention, the machine just learned the rules and managed to build the champions. So in that sense, uh, that is positive and scary from both points of view. It's scary because you say, well, now the machines, you know, the machine uh, that was trained by humans was beaten by the machine who was not trained by humans. So probably humans were a distracting factor. So maybe we are also going in the wrong direction here with our theories. <laughs> and we can tell the uh, machine what the questions are and they can go in a completely different direction than we are going. And uh, that's, that's, that's interesting because as I say also at the beginning, uh, we are using our brain to enhance our brain capacity by mathematics and so on. Now computers is, is, is a new technique. Uh, well, it has been around for a while, but now this, uh, with my, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, it can become more and more and more powerful. I think that we, so nobody say that if there is a fundamental theory of the universe, that the human brain will be capable of solving it. But now the human brain, together with computers, maybe, uh, that, that's something that can be interesting. Now, on, on your point about the anthropic principle, is sometimes misleading what people call anthropic because very much centered on the human beings. But it's, it's not necessarily centered on the human beings, just to, for galaxies to exist. I mean, human beings or dinosaurs or Earth or Moon. So, so they can put uh, that thing to exist. It's not societal nor human related, but it's, uh, uh, of course, we put it in the most dramatic way that is, these conditions are for the anthropic, for, for humans to exist. And it is, it's, I think, it's, we have to take it very seriously, seriously scientifically. And it's a question, as I said before, is uh, which questions are good questions and which questions are not good questions. If the question is answered by anthropic arguments, it may not be a good question. But there are many other questions which are not answered by anthropic arguments, and we, these are the good questions we have to concentrate. So important thing is to define what a good question is, and that's it. OK, well, thank you very much. Eh? OK, thank you very much.
Thanks, my gift from Marcel. Thank you. Thank you.